Aaron, welcome to the show today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, really happy to have you today. Would you mind giving our listeners the 411 on who you are and what brings you to the show today? Yeah, so um, uh, my name's Aaron. Got four kids, been married 22 years, and uh, got five auto repair shops, uh, a sales training organization, and a consulting firm. So that's what I do and uh, stay very, very, very busy doing just that, trying to help other shop owners get their businesses turned around and uh, uh, fix cars in the meantime and trying to help my employees move up in the world. That's great. And where are you located? I'm outside of Nashville, Tennessee. Okay. And when did you get into the, the auto repair business? I started in 1999 in a barn in my backyard, living in a single wide trailer. So, so take us through that. So, you know, uh, fast forward 22 years, sounds like, you know, you've been married for 22 years. If you do the math, yeah. it's right around when, when you started your business. Yeah. So you must have a very supportive wife who, who's uh, been there next to you during this whole, whole process. What was that like starting, um, starting in the backyard like that out of a barn? You know, um, I was ignorant. I was not very bright and I did not know what I was entering into, but you know, that's the beauty of starting a business. If you're dumb enough to, to start it, you don't know how much pain it's going to cause. Uh, you, you probably have a pretty good chance of success. I think if somebody tells you this is going to really suck, this is going to hurt. You may not even attempt it. You may not even start. So I, I love that. I was a little bit ignorant or a lot ignorant. Um, and uh, yeah, we got married right then. Um, I'd met my wife on the internet as a teenager back in 96 when the internet was just a wee baby. And uh, we got married a couple years later, started having kids. And um, uh, don't worry now, we're in a double wide. We've moved up just a smidge. Uh, but uh, we've, uh, you know, we raised our kids in that little single wide trailer until we built a house and then moved on, built another one, then moved on, built another one. Um, but there was a lot behind that. And uh, yeah, I've never worked for anyone else in the auto repair world. I've always just worked for myself. And then as we grew, um, I eventually got stolen from in 2012, set me back along uh, almost, it felt like it should have set me back a decade. It ended up setting me back about probably, probably four years, three years, but it should have set me back a decade. But through God's grace, we got through that. And then, um, ended up getting into consulting and then sales training. And then um, now a few other pieces that go along with auto repair. So yeah, it's kind of blown up since then. When you said that you got stolen from in 2012, I'm taking that that was a kind of like a inside job with the employees. Like you mind elaborating a little yeah. bit on that? So I decided instead of opening new locations, um, I do this real smart thing and get into used car sales. And I was, working on high-end European cars out of three stores, doing about 4.5 million. I was 32 years old. I was making about a million dollars a year. Um, I had an eighth grade education, you know, I'd come from a single wide, thought I had it figured out. And uh, because I'd done it on my own and worked my way up. And I got a big piece of humble pie and um, I got stolen from it. it. Ended up being, a when it was all said and done, just under a million four, it's about a million 375 um, between the theft, the recovery, um, the debt I went into to pull it out. And it was, it was a very rough time. Almost lost everything uh, that lasted multiple years trying to get that cleaned up and get out of that situation. Um, and I was in trouble with the IRS, the Tennessee Department of Revenue. I was four hours from having my, my doors chained shut with sales tax being behind. I was behind on 941s, couldn't file bankruptcy. Um, you know, owed franchise excise tax, owed employees, retirement accounts, owed back rent. Owed, I mean, everybody, I owed everyone. And so I went from being everybody's darling child to all of a sudden overnight being, um, uh, you know, just uh, the outcast. And what was worse was the timing. I just built a home. I just bought a bunch of rental cars. I had just uh, remodeled a new location. And so I had spent basically a million dollars on a bunch of different items. And it was really the perfect time to be stolen from and have it just about ruin me. So, uh, and it was all due in 30 days. And uh, I had bankers that been over backwards for me. 
um, that would let me run my checking account negative for payroll, 75 grand, and would get in trouble, lose their bonuses, and go through all kinds of hell because they believed in my vision. And it was amazing to see people come to me and surround me. My accountant would process my tax return every year, and uh, I'd owe him money every year and not be able to pay it, hoping I'd get a refund, and he'd see the refund come in. And he'd send me those little encouraging texts, Aaron, what are you going to do if you find yourself walking through hell and I'd say, I don't know, Bill, what? And he'd say, keep walking, buddy, keep walking. And I just keep getting these text messages and I keep having people encourage me just when I was just depleted enough. I thought I was about to quit and uh, I had no way out. I mean, I couldn't file bankruptcy because of the 941 debt. Um, I had no way to close the businesses down. I mean, I, I was, I was screwed. Um, my debt payments were 122,000 a month. The principal was about a million three seventy five. With all the interest and everything, it easily got closer to three million. Um, it, it was just a very, very bad, bad time. And uh, thank God my repair shops the whole time were making money. But at some point, it got so bad that I didn't know how to make more money out of them, and I needed to make even more, and I needed to have a better way to do that. So I came up with some proprietary ideas. That I really feel like God kind of downloaded to me and I wrote it down in a yellow pad and keyed it all out. And I now use these systems uh, to teach other shop owners um, all over the place how to uh, run their shops and make more profit as well. So, so when you were going through all that, was there, was there kind of indicators that you were being stolen from or did it just pop up all at once and kind of everything landed on you just all at once? It was pretty all at once, you know, uh, happened in November. We discovered it probably in February and um, it started in November. It was fraud and it's very complicated the way he was doing. It. He was doing it with trade-ins and uh, he was moving money around. And those that have done used car sales, they know how easy it works. But I didn't know till later that the most complicated accounting in the world was used car sales. And I had never heard that before. Um, and as I started asking accountants about it, they're like, oh, yeah, we won't touch it. Oh, yeah, we won't touch it. And I'd ask banks, oh, yeah, we won't touch it. I was like, oh, wow, this is like a really big problem. And once I discovered that, I knew that I was, uh, you know, I, I was in trouble. And uh, they had, I had a great accounting team, but they buried it. Anybody who knows anything about car sales, uh, Car sales, one transaction, um, if I was to compare it to auto repair, is almost like a day's worth of transactions in auto repair. So if you go from selling 30 cars a month to all of a sudden selling 60, 70 cars a month, all of a sudden your office is not anywhere near capable. You need twice the work uh, load available to meet that demand. It's just, there's just so much paperwork with car sales. So he buried my accounting department cash went way up in the accounts. I thought I was making a lot of money. p ls got to be about 60 days behind, then 75 days behind, and that's when I knew I was stolen from. And I had all my auto repair p ls coming in every 30 days. So I had a lean and mean accounting department that was keeping up with everything fine until this took off. And that's one of the things I teach now is you never want your accounting department to be lean. You always want bandwidth. You never know what might happen and what might come. So you've got to have the room to chase a problem if it appears. And when you were ready to give up, you just decided like those text messages were really encouraging and you just decided you just got no, nowhere to go but forward. Is that what it was? No, I was really giving up. Uh, there was a few times in my garage, I just broke down and would just cry and fall to my knees. Um, I tried so hard to be what you would call a good person, to be a, a good Christian, to be a good father, a good husband. And to know that vendors were talking bad about me because I had commercials on the radio, but yet I couldn't pay my parts bill. Um, to know that clients were upset because I couldn't give them their money back when they wanted a refund. You know, to know that employees were mad because they had to hold their checks from Friday to Monday. That sucked to watch really good employees leave one by one by one and they saw the ship sinking. That sucked. And um, it was very, 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 very painful. And as we got closer and closer and closer to it, um, getting really bad, somebody told me about a book 
by Ryan, uh, by Ryan Holiday called The Obstacle is the Way. Little book, I picked it up. I start reading this little book and this book basically covers, um, you know, when you find yourself against the enemy, you got the mountain on the left, you got the sea on the right and the enemy's right in front of you and it's blocking where you want to go. And the enemy, if they're out of the way, that is the fastest route to go around the enemy and go over the mountain or go through the sea would take much longer. And when I read that book and I got to the main concept about three quarters of the way through it, that the obstacle is literally the way to go. It's trying to distract you from it, but that is the route. I closed that book, I jumped up and I sleep in the driver's side of my bed and my wife sleeps in the passenger seat. <laughs> so I jump up out of the bed and we're, you know, we're both reading in our bed. I had the two, you know, the traditional two lampstands on. And I started marching around the bed all the way to the right and all the way back to the left. I was like, that's it. I'm going for it. I'm going for it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And she's like, okay, fine. Yeah, whatever. Do it. And she was numb. You know, she just got numb from it all. But I finally got pissed off. I got angry. It beat me down so hard that I started losing my personality. And all of a sudden I was like, I raised up, I puffed my chest out, I was in it and I started seeing a way through and I got really pissed off. And then as soon as I got mad, I started seeing progress. And that's when I started seeing breakthrough. And that's when I started seeing my old self come back full of piss and vinegar and ready to do this. But until I got angry, I allowed myself just to be beat down, which just kept killing my spirit and killing my spirit and killing my spirit. And I had had a bad temper as a young man from my father who always had a bad temper. So I had always tried to bury my temper. Well, in doing so, I buried passion. And the only thing that was gonna get me out of this was passion, not math, not some new formula, not this or that, I needed passion. Now, later the formulas came to me, later the math helped me. But before then, I, the human part of me needed its cup filled, right? I, I, I needed to be filled back up. I was on empty, I was bone dry. And the moment I got that passion faucet, if you will, turned back on and started filling back up. And then I had that fire in my belly. But I had to kind of tip, you know, tiptoe into that area where I was a little pissed off still to do it. So. And, and once that, that kind of fueled you and, and put you on the right path again, what were the other emotions you started to feel? Like what, once you went through the part of being pissed off, like, in the passion, like, was there a part where it just flipped to where it, it wasn't necessarily, was, was it wanting to, to make it right for all those people that were talking negative about you? Was there a part where you're like, you know what, I'm going to show them who I really am? Yeah, there was a part, uh, not revenge, but, um, you know, one of those hold my beer comments, you know, you're like, watch this. And I don't drink, so that's a big deal. And I, I, I knew in my belly like I, I had this fire start to take off and I knew this was part two. I was getting a do over. And the moment I realized that and I could see it like a video game, like I didn't need to put this pressure in myself that this was my only life. This is the end all be all. Cause I kept thinking, you know, 10 years before this IRS debt falls off, there's no way out. They're going to garnish my wages. I'm going to lose a whole decade of my life. And I was just getting very depressed thinking about that. And the moment that I got pissed off and angry, I think courage had room to reappear and it had not before. I think I finally started believing I had the right to enjoy myself. On the weekends, I would not let myself enjoy my family. I felt guilty for it because we owed so much money. Um, to feel that I could enjoy myself, that I could be brave that I could say, I deserve this, that to fight for myself and my family felt good. Um, and I started to get a little bit of satisfaction finally out of it, just seeing little, you know, little breakthroughs here and there. But don't get me wrong, as those little breakthroughs started compounding, that snowball got bigger and bigger and the debt just started rolling off and rolling off and rolling off. And uh, everything started to change rapidly. And when everything started to change, was there a point where you realized that that more sales and a and more auto repair shops would help you get out of the get out, get you out of where you were too? Was there a mode of expansion that was in there? Yeah, I ended up 
blowing up um, to eight stores from three. And uh, one of the chains that I had bought, I bought two separate deals. And one of the chains I had bought was just honestly a crap chain. One of them was one location in the chain was good. The rest of them were really, really poor. And uh, I got out of those. I took them all on, but then I sold one of them off. And the other one I tried to sell, I wasn't able to. I was able to get the landlord to convert it to a note and get him a sublease to somebody else. I found my way out, basically. Um, but as I navigated that, I found myself believing that sales fixes everything. But what I forgot was that profitable sales fixes everything. Uh. And I took on some bad locations that were just break even stores. You know, and uh, I thought, oh, I can kill it. I can do more than that last guy. He was a loser. And uh, I got in there and go, oh, crap, I'm a loser too. I can't, I mean, this is a hard market. And all my stores had been in wealthy areas before. And so until you've been, I don't care if it's a lemonade stand or an auto repair shop, until you've been in a tough market, you don't know what it's like. You could, you can get very arrogant thinking I got this figured out when, you know, you're doing three times the volume this other guy across town. This other guy across town though, if he's got a tougher market, he might be twice the operator you are. You're not having to deal with any of the challenges. So uh, it was very eye-opening to realize that, um, you know, markets really played into the success of a business big time. So the markets, would you consider that like location or would you consider that more like the actual like towns and cities that you're opening in? Um, both, both because, you know, you could be in an okay town, but in the worst part of that okay town, or you could be in the best part of that okay town. So I would say both. But uh, yeah, you want to be on the right street in the right town. And that's where you always make the most money, you know, location, 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 every single time. And I've, all my stores are in great locations now. So yeah, I'm a big believer in that. And do you, do you own most of your buildings or do you lease them? Um, I own one, lease the rest. I'm trying to buy them, but landlords in this market aren't wanting to sell. So yep. they... They, they, they enjoy me being a good paying tenant. So I, uh, I'm trying to, I own the office building I'm in now and I own other buildings, but I like to own my own, but I'm not hung up on it. I, if I lease, it's fine. I'll own other real estate. It, it all works out to be the same math, but I do prefer it if I can. So along that journey, I would have to think that part of, part of you wanting to rectify everything too was to be a, be a good role model for your kids too. Is that really important to you as well to kind of show them like, like maybe they didn't know exactly what was going on, but I think sometimes kids pick up more than they let on sometimes. Yeah. I was praying for my son one night. He was probably, I mean, he's 16 now. So I don't know. He was eight or nine, something like that. But uh, I'm praying for him one night and he said, daddy, do we have enough money to pay our bills today? And it just like, you know, it's like a dagger to the heart. You're like, oh my gosh, I suck. <laughs> and you're, 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 your nine-year-old's looking at you like, Can, do you need, you need my $2 out of my bank account? And you're just like, ah. Oh. And that, I still remember that day. That rocked me. I went downstairs and told my wife, we're saying too much in front of the kids. They know what's going on. And she's like, what do you expect? I mean, it's all we're doing is surviving right now. And, uh, you know, I, I'd be crushing it. I'd make 140 grand in a month and have 132 go straight out the door to pay debt. I'd just watch it go by. Couldn't do anything with it. And so if I wasn't clearing, you know, a million, two million, four, I, was, I, I wasn't even able to stay open because I had to pay income tax on this. That's the problem. You know, I'm paying income tax on the money that I'm making to pay off the debt. I'm still the largest theft in the state of Tennessee at this point. I have a you know great record here in the state. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it was a very, very scary time. My daughter, once uh, I started consulting, my daughter, um, to give you an idea of the bond, I was up front teaching at an event and she laid on the floor doing her math homework with her AirPods and, and she's got her little feet up in the air and she's kicking them back and forth. And she just laid there on the floor right next to the podium. And I had about 250 people there. And they just thought it was the coolest thing. And she just wanted to be near her dad. Um, you know, it, it drew us together. It made us a lot tighter. But man, we lost some time too. 
I mean, th- I was working six days a week. I only took off Sundays. And Sundays, I couldn't mentally turn it off. I just worried all day long. Um, and it's sad to me because there are so many businesses right now that are literally going down into this right now, right? They're lying to themselves. They're taking on a new charge account. They're using up a credit line at the bank. And they're slowly going down but because they don't understand their numbers. They don't even realize that they're going further and further into the hole. When right now they could do something and they won't do anything drastic until there are hundreds of thousands in the hole. And then they get to me and I'm like, oh my gosh, I hope I can pull you out of this. Because a lot of them don't have the drive that I did. So it, it's, it's, it's rough to, to see that happen. It's rough to see that manifest before you and know that you could stop it if they would just listen. Yeah, I appreciate your honesty when you're talking about the giving up part and you say, oh, no, I, I almost gave up a bunch of times because <laughs> I think that's that's the hard part is I think when you're when you have your own business, there's everybody has different challenges. But when you get on the other side of them, that, that's when you can kind of reflect like you are now. And it has to feel really good to, to where you are today compared to where you've been. And I think part of it is never, never losing part of that identity that, you know, if you can go through that, I would imagine when, you know, March 15th rolled around last year and we get hit with um, COVID and, and uh, it changes the world that you're like, Hey, I got this. I went through something, you know, that was 10 times this, I, I can handle it. Not knowing really what it was, but you knew that, that there had to have been a part of you that felt like, boy, I'm, I'm kind of prepared for adversity. Yeah. Um, I had been consulting probably four years at that point and, um, COVID hit and I was in Turks and Caicos with my family. And my wife said, you need to do a webinar every single night this week. I was like, really? She's like, yeah. So I went on live and I just started breaking down every, all the, scientific studies about the disease, what I saw the government doing, what I saw interest rates doing, what the stock market was doing. And um, it, there was several nights I had over a thousand people watching. So I was like, okay, this is going somewhere. And uh, then I kept doing it. I got all the way home and did it all the way through until, gosh, I went from March 15th to April 15th till tax day. And I did it every single night, except Sunday night, six days a week. And we flew back home on Sunday and I just kept doing it, kept doing it. And I would go from 8 p.m. to about 10.30 at night. And then from April 15th to April 30th, I did it uh, five nights a week. My wife was like, you gotta pull back some. You're, the family's fried, you're fried. And so I cut Saturday nights. And I had at some points, guys, four to 5,000 people on live, on a Facebook live. I didn't know it. It was chiropractors. It was doctors. It was attorneys. It was people that owned dry cleaners. And it was everybody that owned an auto repair shop was telling their buddies. And so I had about 600 clients of myself and all of my clients told all of their friends and it just went like a wildfire. And I was bringing on the best accountants I could find in the country, the best attorneys, um, everybody that did anything with uh, employee uh, HR issues, et cetera, because we were all having them with employees not wanting to come to work, et cetera. So it was a very, very rough time. But what was nuts was my consulting company grew during that period of time. We ended up giving all of our members half off that month. We had a bunch that were freaking out. So we just went ahead and gave them half off. And I'm proud to say that by the end of COVID, probably 95% of all of our clients got both the PPP money and the idle grant and were able to apply uh, for the idle loan at the end and we walked them through all of it and all of my competition i would say that it would be probably uh the best maybe was 50 percent of theirs if not maybe only 30 percent. we had a lot of clients coming to us saying none of them were talking about it or teaching on it and so uh yeah had uh me going through that allowed me to even lead them when I had no idea where I was going by God's grace to get everybody to the other side and get them the loans and the funding they needed to stay open. And that was a, that was a very, very hard time. Probably the closest to burnout I've ever been in my life was last year during that six weeks. 
It was harder than when I got stolen from. Not emotionally, harder just physically. Because I was, my own stores were in trouble. I was going in there, cutting everyone's pay, telling everybody you're on hourly. We're in survival mode. We epoxied floors. We, you know, painted walls. We did whatever we could. But our business cut in half overnight. And so we were in total survival mode. It was very, very scary. And, uh, uh, you know, our team stood behind us. They backed us. But we got through it. And every day I'd get home at 6.30, 6.45. My wife would give me some food. I'd wolf it down real quick. I'd jump in front, make some notes in front of my camera, turn the camera on. About 7.45, start talking to people. 8 o'clock start. And I'd end about 10.30 to 11.30, depending on what was going on that night. And I did that every night for six nights in a row. And then I did it five nights in a row. But I didn't know it. I mean, I was exhausted. At the end, I'd go to a conference and people would tell me, Aaron, had you not done that, I don't know where I would have been. Every night, I'd start to watch TV. I'd get too stressed out and I'd be thinking, what's Aaron talking about? And they'd turn me on their TV. And uh, they said that it was keeping them hopeful, keeping them alive. At the time, I didn't realize it was that impactful. But it was because of what I'd been through. Uh, I'd been through. And so I appreciate you making that connection. It was, it was a very... It, it, it was a strength that was needed later. That's for sure. Yeah. And it almost seems like you were used in that moment too. Like, you know, it set you up back then. And then, you know, before you know it, you're, you're leading out packs of people really. And um, I think you're, you're absolutely right. The business owners didn't matter really what industry they were in. If they're small business owners who, who got into their profession and they've made a livelihood of it, they just needed somewhere to turn and, and practical stuff because there was, there was stuff out there. I think there were people that realized that they could try and make money off of COVID and they were doing different kind of, uh, you know, seminars that were paid to play and stuff like that. Yep. But I think that the guys out there just talking, um, like, here's what I'm doing in my business. Um, you know, I'm sure you can grab a few things out of there and you're absolutely right about like the PPP, um, money like people didn't know how to fill it out they didn't know where to go they they go to the bank they've been with for 20 years and the bank didn't even know how to tell them to fill out the forms and um yeah i, I think it, i think there's a lot of connections there of what what you did was just real good um good work and just paying it forward really yeah we were able we had clients that hadn't gotten funding and we were able to get them either with my bank here or we were putting them with PayPal, with QuickBooks and others. We were finding every oddball company and helping everyone figure out how to do it, what to fill out, what forms to turn in. And we're getting them funded in two to three days. I mean, hundreds of them all at once. And uh, we weren't gonna let anybody fall through the cracks. And 95% is conservative. I, I bet we were closer to 98, 99% of our clients that got funded. So I was very proud of that. Yeah. So what about now when, when most people are saying we're out of COVID, um, I think most small businesses are really feeling the after effects of like the, the employee crisis that's going on. Um, are you feeling it in the, in your line of business? And what are you telling your, your folks out there that you're um, teaching and leading and uh, consulting with about the job market right now? Yeah. So um, I'm not feeling it in the office as much in the office uh, world, but I am definitely feeling it in the auto repair world. Um, C, we have C, B, and A level technicians, A being the best. And a lot of those C level guys that were making 50 grand could go sit at home and make 45, 50 grand. So why go to work, right? So a lot of them checked out of the market, which put more pressure on B techs than more pressure on A techs. And then on top of that, new cars started getting depleted. And as they got depleted because factories were shut down, then factories started coming back on. But if another factory that was producing another part for that car wasn't also getting turned back on, we had unbalanced inventory supply chains. So everything might be there, but this one thing, and then we'd get that one thing and then something else would pop up, et cetera. So we went from, let's say out of a hundred cars in the road, if 20 of them were, were under two years old, meaning they needed no service. Now 90, of them need service and only 10 don't because no one can buy new cars. So people are buying, you know, 10 year old cars, uh, or I'm sorry, two year old cars, one year old cars instead. And so now cars that normally would sit in the lot for a while and not need a timing belt, all of a sudden need a timing belt because they're not sitting there for sale. They're actually being driven. 
And so it's it's ramped up the auto repair world. So we're probably gonna have a crazy year, um, but skilled labor is where I'm seeing the shortage. Blue collar, skilled labor. And it's not a lie. It is is absolutely real. And until we get a lot of that unemployment to stop, like our stops, I think in Tennessee, July 2nd, we're not gonna see some of that lower level talent start getting back into the market, which then relieves a little bit more at the higher level and then so on and so on and so on. And we need that. We need that gradual stair step that people used to do. The government intervention in a lot of ways actually hurt us more than helped us. They, they put too much uh, uh, support out there, which allowed people to stay home too long and um, create some bad habits for them, right? They're not going to be embracing dignity and hard work, et cetera. Um, what makes you know a man or a woman uh, really be proud of what they've achieved. Um, and instead, we've turned us into a society of, well, what's in it for me? You know, I'm going to get what's for my family and, and mine. And the sad thing about that is if we all become selfish in that way, that's the end of America, right? If we all become selfish and I'm going to go out and I'm going to, in a healthy way, go out and work and achieve for my family what I want my family to have, and that's healthy. But if we're going to go out and demand and have a handout, that's not. And so with all of that happening in our industry um, and technicians going up like crazy as far as cost, I mean, I'd have a guy making 40 bucks an hour and all of a sudden he's like, if you don't give me 47, I'm walking. And you're like, what the heck do I do? And, you know, that kind of an attitude because they've got literally customers faking that they're customers, getting a test drive, riding with a technician, offering them in the car, $50 an hour to go work in another shop. I mean, it was so cutthroat because every shop is just so varied across the country. So uh, it's, a, it's a tough market. We're teaching people hiring techniques. We're teaching people how to write a good ad um, and uh, what kind of offers to get to put out there to get someone to actually show. So. And that was going to be my question to you. Uh, listening to you was going to ask about, have you had to increase your, your salaries? And you kind of answered that, that, yeah, absolutely. You've had to increase your salaries. And I think you hinted towards... Uh, my follow-up question was going to be, did you have to raise your prices because you, you had to pay pay your employees more? Not yet. Um, I'm advising my clients to wait. Uh, our parts have gone up. And so because of that, our parts go through a multiplier matrix, which has already raised the price of our parts. So there's a little bit more profit on that side naturally. Um, we are very close to having to raise our prices, though, on labor. So that's around the corner. And how do you feel? How do you feel about like when shortly here, when you put some ads out, and you get people that are going to apply, and you look at their resume, and then for the last you know year or longer, there's a gap that their last job was in early 2020, and you realize this yep. is somebody that that was home for for 15 months and um, took the unemployment for that long, and now they're ready to re-enter the workforce, like. You know, it was, it was easy to judge that in the beginning, but now you just got to go, you know what, I'm sure they're a good person because I had friends that I found out they're like, yeah, I guess I'm going to stay home. I mean, blah, blah, blah. And I'm going, really? I kind of liked you. <laughs> you know, so it's like, uh, and I'm not trying to be judgmental, but when you own your own business, there's no option. You got to go to work. But then when you see someone just say, yeah, I'm just not going to go because I don't have to. And there's no way to prove it. There's no way to prove it's not quote COVID, you know, that, that was tough. That was definitely tough to not judge someone. And so when you found yourself doing it, you kind of had to say, well, do I need an employee? Yes. All right. Well, I guess I got to get over it. You're not going to be able to get only entrepreneurial type thinking employees. You got to get people that are going to jump in and make it happen. And that's what I had to do. So, uh, Sometimes you got to ignore that part of the resume. I, li I like that. I, I really do. Because I think that's what people are going through right now. It, it, they're in that moment of trying to figure out, should they judge? Shouldn't they judge? And you're right. Um, you know, the employers are just in a spot where they just need to hire. And, and I think we don't have a choice. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. You, you have to hire. It really doesn't matter what industry. I think you're everybody's seeing it. W what do you say to the entrepreneurs that have listened to us today and they hear your story and they may be going through something that um, in, in their life feels like uh, what you went through but back in 2012 and 13. Like what kind of um, advice do you have for them? What do you tell them? 
You know, I would tell them to not give up. Surround yourself with positive people. Don't keep it a secret. Um, get outside perspectives on how to fix your situation. Um, I think I could have got out of my situation in a year if I'd had more wisdom around me. I made several panic and fearful decisions that I wish I had not made. So I would encourage people, get smart people around you. If you do that, that will make all the difference in the world. I'd, I'd like to mention this too. I'm curious, like how important it was having a good lawyer at that point um, played into that, into helping I you wish it played more. It did not help me as much as I thought. The number one thing that helped me was being savvy, quick, um, uh, nimble, and able to adjust. Those were the things. I just, I couldn't get emotional about it. Somebody didn't work out. Okay, great. Move on to the next one. This didn't happen. Okay, great. Whatever. If I couldn't sit there and go, oh man, this sucks. I mean, I had to just keep taking action, 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 action. Massive action over and over in a row commit, you know, came together to create momentum for me. And that momentum is what got me out of it. And, uh, and I'm going to be honest, I had some kick ass employees that stuck with me through all of it that I have rewarded today. Um, but a lot of them didn't. Those ones that did, I, I took care of them. And, and where does the future bring you as, as far as your consulting and, and your business? Like what, what's on the, the future agenda for you? You know, I'm going to keep growing my shops. I'm going to open more, but my number one thing right now is probably going to be just focusing on uh, uh, the consulting side that is blowing up. Um, it's getting larger every day. I want, I, at this moment, run one of the largest masterminds in the world. And it just happens to be focused on auto repair, which is pretty cool. Had a lot of people fly out just to see our mastermind in action and see how we have it designed and how we run it. Um, and I'm very proud of the community we've built. It's filled with the most amazing people on the planet. Um, they are what makes it so great. And uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm totally blessed to be here and to um, have uh, the Lord make this an option for me to even be a part of it. It's, it's just huge. So the future is really going to be me focusing on raising up leaders in that area of expertise in auto repair so that I can get them to become something great in their town, in their community. So. And if people want to get more of you, Aaron, and find out, uh, learn more about your story, learn more about what you're doing today, uh, where can they find more about you? Um, I would say probably on Facebook, uh, Shop Fix Academy's Facebook page. Um, also, uh, they can probably look uh, on YouTube. We, we're updating some new stuff there. We operate a lot inside of uh, Facebook groups. So a lot of people have no idea how large our organization is because we keep it somewhat hidden. Uh, but those are probably the best places to uh, follow along and see what's going on. Now it's time we solve the equation to Aaron's success. This is when I get to ask you seven rapid fire questions to solve the equation to, to your keys of success. Are you ready? Oh boy. Okay. All right. Best seminar or teaching that you've ever been to? Um, uh, I was in a guy named Greg. I was in his living room, sitting on the couch, and uh, that changed my life in 2006. Ten people in attendance. Favorite item you bought recently under a hundred bucks? Uh, I'm looking around, thinking. <laughs> I'm not very material. I'd say uh, a pair of sunglasses, Serengeti's. Name an idol or hero of yours that you've met in person. That I've met in person. Um, probably Marcus Lemonis. Favorite book to give as a gift? Um... Be My Guest by Conrad Hilton. Something you do every morning before you brush your teeth. I look at the schedule for the day. Your personal mantra or favorite quote? Um, I, got a I mean, I got so many. Do whatever it takes, company. 
and place you go to decompress and reset. My lake house. All right, Aaron, thanks so much for being a guest on the show today. I hope everybody enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. And we look forward to watching online the future that you keep keep uh, moving forward and doing some great things. So thanks so much for being on today, Aaron. All right. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it.